In the previous video, we performed a dynamic frequency analysis to obtain the structure's natural frequencies and mode shapes. We will now go one step further and subject the structure to an earthquake in the form of a dynamic response spectrum analysis. This will use the results of the dynamic frequency analysis and will produce actual deflections, forces, moments, and reactions. Let's start by setting up the earthquake data in the form of some spectral load cases. We can do this by opening the spectral load datasheet. Earthquake loading codes typically require you to consider the earthquake forces in both major axes of the structure. Because our structure is parallel to the global axes, we will create a spectral load case for the earthquake in the x direction and another one for the earthquake in the perpendicular direction. We will call these load cases 11 and 12. Starting with load case 11, we need to define the mode shapes that contribute to this load case. Each line in the table represents one mode, and we will start with mode 1. The next field is where we define the spectral curve, known as the response spectra, that defines the properties of the earthquake. Space gas comes with libraries of standard spectral curves from various earthquake loading codes and from actual earthquakes. You can also input your own custom spectral curves. You can get to the spectral curves by clicking the Spectral Curve Editor button in the bottom corner. You can see that some curves are from actual earthquake data. and some are idealized, smoothed curves from earthquake loading codes. A spectral curve is not a time-lapse representation of the earthquake event. Rather, it is a graph of the normalized ground accelerations for structures of varying natural frequency. Let's choose the curve for New Zealand with site subsoil class C that corresponds to shallow soil. The damping is a property of the spectral curve and is for information purposes only. Next, we must specify the mass case that we are going to use in this spectral load case. In this example, we have put all our masses into load case 1. Finally, we must specify the earthquake direction in the form of a vector with components in each of the global axis directions. Spectral load case 11 is along the x-axis, and so we just need to put a 1 into the x-vector component. Now we need to build up this load case with additional modes that will each contribute towards the final solution. If we don't include enough modes, then the results will not be accurate. Generally speaking, the modes that contribute the most will be the ones that have vibrations in the direction of the earthquake. Without knowing exactly which modes to include, let's just try including modes 1 to 3 by simply typing the load case number into the next two rows in the table. You can see that the data from the first row is copied into the new rows as we go. If we haven't included enough modes, we will get a low mass participation factor, and we will then have to add more modes and reanalyze. More on this later. Now let's define spectral load case 12 to be the same as load case 11, but this time with the earthquake in the Z direction. Most earthquake loading codes require you to consider extra earthquake directions between the two basic perpendicular directions. This usually involves combining the actions in one direction with 30% of the actions in the perpendicular direction. We can easily add these as four extra combination load cases. Load case 13 combines 100% of load case 11 with 30% of load case 12 and so on. Finally, because a dynamic oscillation involves both positive and negative movements of the structure, we must add extra load cases that are in the reverse direction of our six basic load cases. Load case 21 is the reverse of load case 11, and so on.
From our two basic earthquake directions, we now have a total of 12 load cases. You may need to add your own additional combinations depending on which earthquake code you are using. You may also wish to combine the spectral load cases with other non-spectral load cases such as dead loads, live loads, and wind loads. We are now ready to perform the analysis. We will leave the load case list field blank so that all spectral load cases are analyzed, and then select the desired loading code, the required limit state, auto scaling options, signs of the results, and spectral curve multiplier. These settings are explained in more detail in the Space Gas Help System. The spectral curve multiplier, in particular, is dependent on a number of local factors that you can get to by clicking the Click to Change button. Finally, the Mode Combination method lets you select how the results for each mode are combined into one set of results for each spectral load case. SRSS is the simplest and most common method, however CQC is recommended when some of the mode shapes have natural frequencies that are close together. At the end of the analysis, the lowest mass participation factor is reported, and it should be at least 90% for a good result. Anything less than 90% means that additional modes must be added to our spectral load cases. Our 14% result tells us that we definitely need to consider more modes. Seeing as we analyzed six modes in our dynamic frequency analysis, let's include them all here. Now let's reanalyze and see what result we get this time. This is a much better result, and with a mass participation factor of 96%, we can now be sure that we have included enough modes. A dynamic response spectrum analysis produces actual deflections, forces, moments and reactions, just like a static analysis, and we can view them in the normal way. Finally, you can view a bit more information about the spectral load cases by getting a report. For spectral load case 11, you can see the mass participation factor of 96%. You can also see the contribution of each mode toward the final result. Note that modes 2 and 4 account for a total of 94% on their own, indicating that they are the dominant modes of vibration for an earthquake in the X direction. Similarly, spectral load case 12 has mode 1 as its dominant mode for an earthquake in the Z direction, with a contribution of 88% on its own. Going back to the animated mode shapes, you can see that mode 1 moves predominantly in the Z direction, and this explains why it is the dominant mode for that direction. Whereas mode 4 moves predominantly in the X direction and is the dominant mode for an earthquake in that direction. You can now proceed to use the deflections, forces, moments, and reactions in the design modules in exactly the same way as if they had come from a static analysis.